So, you've got an idea for a business. The store of your dreams. There's just one thing to figure out. Everything. That's why Shopify's all-in-one commerce platform makes it easy to sell online, in person, and everywhere else. Sell on social media, source products with an app to get that first sale feeling. It's the only solution that gives you everything you need to sell everywhere you want. So when you're ready to bring your idea to life, power it up with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash listen. Consciousness, does it survive after death? This interview is pre-recorded. Here's a sample. One of the things that comes through in the research is that the higher, the more advanced the spirit, the more difficult it is for them to get through. The spirits that get through the easiest are those that are very low levels. My guest is Michael Tim. This was the 2021 Bigelow contest. And according to Robert Bigelow, quote, I personally believe human consciousness does survive and it probably matters what you do with your life while you're here. And I'm already convinced that that's not what this is all about. One of Bigelow's experiences, he was three years old when his grandparents had a close encounter with a UFO. They had missing time, which was terrifying, but they couldn't talk about it. He says it was 1947 and we just didn't have a lot of information about ETs. When his father died, he was 18, and he died in a private airplane crash. He said that's what started him becoming more curious about what happened when you died. After several deaths in his family and the death of his wife, he said he found a renewed interest in the survival of consciousness, and that's what that contest is all about. And it's continuing, too. You can read all of the essays, including the top three, at BigelowInstitute.org. I was just a lot more curious about what Michael's essay was about, saying that basically we proved that there is life after death a long time ago. Been there, done that. And we're still trying to reinvent the wheel. So how did we prove it? And what were the stories that he dug up? That's worth listening to and worth reading about. Michael Tim, T-Y-M-N, if you're doing a Google search. A journalism school graduate with a full-time career in insurance claims management, also a freelance writer for 70 years. So his background is extensive, traveled all over the world. Most of his writing was sports-related. He says his focus changed after he retired in 2002, from sports to psychical research. And you can find his books, Bestseller Afterlife Revealed, and the most recent one, No One Really Dies. I found him following the blog, his blog, at White Crow Books. And I also have the book, The Afterlife Revealed, What Happens After We Die. We're going to clarify, he wants to make sure you know that he isn't a scientist. His approach helped him qualify as a runner-up. The runner-up prize was $50,000. And now, my guest, Michael Tim. You actually go back into the 20s with information from the people who were researching and actively researching, interacting with mediums. And there are 11 people that you, you cite in your paper that eventually themselves, four of them, became mediums. Was that a surprise? Not really. I mean, there are many more than the 11 that I cited that I, I could have gone into, but I was limited to 25,000 words, and uh, so those were the best 11. I thought the most representative of, and had the most to say, but I could have gone to uh, 30 or 35 witnesses, and maybe 15 of them would have been medium. But uh, again, with the 25,000 word limit, 11 was all I could do. The one I really wanted to get in there was um, Dr. James Hislop, who probably the most knowledgeable of all the um, researchers, but he came after Sir Oliver Lodge, who was the um, my 11th witness. And I had already reached 25,000 word limit, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Dr. Hislop didn't make it. Okay, so you did it. In a unique approach, you had the legal representation saying, these are the claims and here are my, here, here are my uh, people who are going to testify and this is the evidence. I thought that was a, a nice way to present it that made it, that was very articulate. In, in effect, it was a simulated trial and the uh, school of, of the afterlife, uh, in effect, sued the nihilistic school and presented the evidence that there is an afterlife. Uh, and my, my 11 witnesses started with Judge John Edmonds, who was probably the first psychical researcher. He, he became interested back in 1850, the, um, 1848, as you probably know, being the kickoff for the Fox sisters. And then uh, there were various people who became uh, interested, but Judge Edmonds was probably the um, most dedicated of all those researchers. And then I went to... Um, Dr. George Dexter, a physician who was a friend of Dr. Edmonds, 
and then on to Professor Robert Hare, who was a uh, chemistry professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and to Governor Nathaniel Talmadge, who was a uh, a U.S. Senator from New York and later a governor of Territory of Minnesota, and then to uh, Professor James Mapes, who was a chemistry professor at the American Institute, then to uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who was well known as the co- co-originator with uh, Charles Darwin of the um, natural selection theory of evolution, even though Darwin gets all the credit for it. And then Sir William Crookes, who was a, British, a famous British chemist and physicist, who um, was instrumental in the development of the X-ray. Then Sir William Barrett, who was a professor of physics at the Royal College and one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research. Then the one minister I had, uh, Reverend William Staten Moses, who was an Anglican priest who um, actually was somewhat divorced from the uh, Anglican Church and taught English at University College in London. And then the tenth one was Dr. Richard Hodgson, who was the um, the first real paid psychical researcher, I guess. He, was, he came from uh, England at the request of... Uh, William James of Harvard to be the executive secretary of the American Society back in 1886, I think it was. And then I ended up with Sir Oliver Lodge, who was a physics professor and a pioneer in radio and electricity um, in England. Those are my 11. There are some efforts from some of these guys before they get into it to discredit the psychics and the mediums that they chose to research. And I think that was also helpful, too, because it gives people who are maybe a little bit more um, concerned about whether this is legit, the efforts and lengths that these guys went to to try and affirm that this wasn't, you know, they weren't being hoodwinked, so to speak. Right. They, were, they all started as skeptical. They were all aware of the scientific method, and, and they tried to be objective. Um, most of them... Um, Said they were. They set out to debunk the uh, mediums, and uh, none of them was a what, what might be considered a, a devout believer. But they all, you know, gradually came to believe that, you know, they were they were in touch with the spirit world. At the time that you know there there was a belief that they they were actually in touch with the secondary personality of the medium, but that there was just too much volition, too much. Uh, personality coming from the spirits to um, believe that that was the case. This is stuff that was done prior to well, some, a lot of it, 1900 prior to that. And so here we have, in some cases, very solid documentation of people who witnessed these events. And yet it's almost been erased. It's really difficult to find this. You, you have to dig. And not only that, there was there were efforts to discredit it, saying, well, you know, that was all, they were just wanting to believe. So they convinced themselves it was true. It's really frustrating for somebody like me, who's had experiences, to try and find out where the threads are that lead to accurate information that has been some way documented and proved. And to know that it goes back that far, and we're still basically trying to reinvent the wheel and prove there's life after death, like the experience that you had writing this essay. Where do you think we stand with this now? I don't think we've made much progress. As I, as I stated in my paper, I, I think the case was made as well as it could be made by 1920, maybe even by 1900. And it, we've had a lot of evidence since then, you know, with, uh, with near-death experiences, with some mediumship study by... Um, Dr. Gary Schwartz and Julie Beichel, um, and a lot of other evidence, but I call that, you know, frosting on the cake. Um, even myself, I, I consider myself, I, I don't believe 100% in anything, I don't think. I'm, I, I say I'm a 98.8% on life after death, uh, and I probably will never be higher than 98.8%. There's still some possible explanation that, you know, I don't understand um, that could explain it, but um, I'm I'm satisfied with the 98.8 percent, and I don't think we'll ever be, you know, 100 percent on that or anything else. I think that's fair. What makes you still? Mm-hmm. Why are you holding out that last little tiny itty bit of that increment? Well, there's still those explanations uh, as far as the subconscious creating the um, 
so-called spirit uh, messages or telepathy involved that the medium is reading the mind of the um, sitter and coming up with the information. Of course, the, the rebuttal to that is that in many cases, or a number of cases anyway, that the sitter doesn't know the information, but it's still coming through. But the skeptics still say there's, you know, some subconscious element to it that we don't understand. Well, I yeah, there's two or three things you cite in there, like a, a, a group consciousness that somehow there's access to this pool of information, and that's where it's coming from. Um, the, I do like in your book, the the this is the afterlife revealed, what happens after we die. You have several, mm-hmm. s- several sources in there that you have named, and one was actually a survivor from the Titanic who was a, a newspaper reporter. Um, he, he was a writer, and I had seen this story before, and so it was really nice to see William Stead is the name, journalist. I like it when I see evidence that journalists have come back to try and maybe leave a, a breadcrumb or two, and I like the length that you have gone to try and credit these older elder statesmen of this era saying that, you know, there's not enough evidence that we have brought forward that actually shows that this is relevant. I don't know how to go forward from here by just con- continuing to, you know, rehash the old content without saying in some way, shape or form, maybe we've evolved. And so it doesn't have to be as in your face. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and the, I guess the big question is, do we really want to know with 100% uh, certainty? Um, I, I had a good, uh, one of the quotes in all of my books, I think, is, is that supposedly came from um, uh, Victor Hugo's writing. Victor Hugo was sitting with a medium in, um, on the island of Jersey, I think it was, uh, between England and France, and uh, uh, wait, let me just find it here. Um, I can't. I don't remember the name of the medium, but anyway, he he asked me the um, spirit that he was communicating with, who was supposedly Martin Luther, the spirit of Martin Luther. You know, why doesn't God better reveal Himself? Or you know, in my say the question is, why don't um, we have better proof of of the spirit world? And the, the answer that came from Martin Luther is uh, to quote here, because doubt is the instrument which forges the human spirit. If the day were to come when the human spirit no longer doubted, the human soul would fly off and leave the plow behind, for it would have acquired wings. The earth would lie fallow. Now God is the sower and man is the harvester. The celestial seed demands that the human plowshare remain in the furrow of life. So in effect, he's saying doubt, doubt is necessary. If we all knew for certain that, um, you know, we lived on after death, uh, that there is a God, uh, we might not face our challenges in the same way. That's the way I interpret it anyway. Well, and the argument is that this is a school for learning. Basically, the soul is here to learn. Right, right, right. Overcoming adversity is our primary objective. If we, if we didn't have that adversity, then, uh, you know, we'd be like Nero, um, who was strumming his fiddle while Rome burned. Okay, we're kind of doing that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you know, a reality check. The other thing was that there was a point where getting information from the spirits at first, it was kind of a higher guidance and more esoteric maybe, and then it devolved as some of the ones who weren't quite as highly motivated and looking for us to improve came in and I guess threw a monkey wrench into it. And so that by, by I think around 1920 is what you say there, there was no more advancement. They kind of backed off because we were not getting it and we weren't improving. So um, can you address that? Yeah. Well, initially from 1850 to 1860 um, um, beginning with the book by Judge Edmonds and, and uh, Dr. Dexter, uh, that, that book goes to about a thousand pages and it's mostly philosophy. It's, it's teachings. It's not about evidence. And, and, um, I think that book contains as much as, you know, you really need the, the spirit world tried to explain what they were all about, but, um, people wanted evidence. And so, you know, um, in 1882, the society for psychical research was formed in London to try and gather the evidence. 
and it was very trivial. I mean, the teachings were evidential. The um, the evidential stuff was very trivial, and people complained, "Well, this is too trivial. Why don't they tell us something meaningful?" So it was sort of a damned if you do and damned if you don't. And then during the 1920s, we, there were three cases. The famous Marjorie case is probably the one that did it more than anything else. There, there were a number of scholars involved, a number of um, um, very well-known men who um, investigated the medium known as Marjorie. Her name was actually Mina Crandon, who was the wife of a Boston physician. Um, this investigation went on for three or four years, and the researchers were all divided. There were, you know, half a dozen of them that said, "No doubt, this is, you know, the real deal." And the other, ha- and then uh, the other six, about four of them, um, said, "Well, we don't know. There's just not enough here. We got it. We have to look at it more." And then there were two of them, Houdini being one of them. Uh, the ma- you know, Houdini, the master magician, said, "No, it's all fraud. I can do this myself." And there was one other one that I, I forget his name that uh, said that. You know, it was all fake, but um, that that sort of well, actually, that that was Dr. Joseph Ryan, who, as you may know, is considered one of the founders of parapsychology. So that that I think was the turning point. Dr. Ryan didn't believe that Marjorie Marjorie was um, genuine; that he that she tried to trick him, and and uh, so he. That's when psychical research became parapsychology during the early 1930s and they got away from spirits they got away from the whole idea of life after death and just concentrated on ESP and PK and um, you know after that we never really got back to uh, psychical research to the whole survival issue they tried to avoid it because it was so controversial in the um, academic world to this day, a parapsychologist or anybody interested in the subject has a sort of tippy toe around the subject. If they're talking about life after death, I mean, they're they're caught between the the, the world of science and uh, religion. Um, religion um, sees it as not not saying the same thing that that, that the Bible says, and so they uh, object to it, and um, science objects to it. So between a hard place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, in a hard place. I think you know, in part of the stuff that you spell out, it, it's they're expecting from the people who have passed on to bring back evidence that is irrefutable, and right. maybe the person who just passed on isn't capable of doing that at this point. There's one I can't remember where I, which which one, but the guy who had passed over, uh, he was coming in and he said, listening to you, you sound, and it was like being yelled at through a drum where he said, I am much more, and his his frequency is lighter, so, so in the transmission it would be kind of light and airy, where th- him hearing the people, the humans, the manifest plane, it's like being hit with a drum, and so I think that really spells out the challenge from both sides to become more aware and um, perceptive, to me that made much more sense when, when that spirit was trying to say, look, this is the level I'm at, this is the level that you're at, and right now there's no happy medium. Yeah, and what, one of the things that comes through in the research is that the higher, the more advanced the spirit, the more difficult it is for them to get through. The spirits that get through the easiest are those that are very low levels, so that they're at a lower vibration or closer to the earth vibration and, and that's one of the reasons I think that, that we the, the spirit world itself decided to withdraw that the lower level spirits were interfering with what they were trying to get through in their teachings and uh, according to um, the messages coming through St. Moses the, the, the Anglican minister I mentioned uh, earlier they decided somewhere around 1870 okay we, we reached the point of diminishing returns and what we're giving you we can't give you much more so we're, we're, we're pulling back again the question is to what extent the spirit um is advanced and all indications are that and when i say lower level i'm not saying evil spirits there are there are apparently number of evil spirits among those lower level spirits but um uh, the information we're getting from the lower level um, is from spirits who really don't know what's happening yeah. above them. Yeah, you yeah. Know, that, I think that's the biggest thing with uh, 
spiritualism that it, that it taught that it's not just the humdrum heaven and horrific hell that, that religion teaches or throw in purgatory that Catholics believe is sort of the middle ground. Uh, it's many levels, and, and we when we transition at death to, to the spirit world, we go to a certain level and, and advance from there. And the way I've heard it in, you know, that many mansions theory is that whatever you have aspired to attain here, you step from this level to the spirit realm. And then if you continue to evolve, ascend, then you come back and start at the level above where you departed, not, not as in you graduated, but you're still a work in progress and continuing to ascend. I'll use that word. Yeah, that's the way I understand it. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Robert Hare, who was one of my 11 witnesses, uh, I mentioned he was a chemistry professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. He called it a moral specific gravity that, you know, we all depart this world at a certain moral specific gravity and and, uh, begin in the next world at that point. Most of the evidence indicates that people, the average person, well, they say there's, you know, seven levels on the other side, uh, but that's just mostly symbolic. I I don't think they really put a number to them, but that, you know, using that symbolism, most people go to the third level. The first level is is sort of the earthbound level where people don't even know that they're they're dead, Uh, and maybe and maybe at the second level they're half awake and and beginning to realize that, you know, they pass from the earth body. In the third level, they're, they're aware of the fact that they've separated from the earth body, but um, they still don't know very much. And then at the fourth level and so on up, it gets to, to a point where, you know, it's, it's beyond human understanding. When you were researching this, you chose to focus on the mediums that are not the typical medium we're going to see now on TV or on the internet, these were an evidential medium, or at least uh, one who didn't have to go out and um, do a, a, a sideshow to produce results. They actually were able to, in front of a crowd or in front of an audience, a small audience, whether it was daytime or nighttime, have a response. And this is when table tipping was popular. Can you explain why you chose these type of mediums and what the difference is? Well, most of the mediums we see on TV today or hear about or maybe even sit with uh, are clairvoyant type mediums. Uh, the, the mediums, they're, they're getting little visions of or getting pieces of messages shared and they're trying to make uh, sense out of them. The, the old mediums were primarily trans mediums. They go into a trance and the spirit would communicate through them, that, that they'd be in a trance while the spirit was communicating. But there were also direct voice mediums, so the mediums didn't really go into a trance. The, the, the voice came through in another part of the room. Uh, then we had physical mediums who um, you know, gave demonstrations of levitations, materializations, and so forth. Um, it was just totally different from the clairvoyance we have today. Well, some of it in there is absolutely astounding. The one where you're talking about hearing the music and instruments playing and then somebody else playing the instrument. There was one where the, an accordion was, the guy b- bought the accordion specifically for this demonstration. And the accordion is walking around the room being played and they're saying, do you believe this? And he says, well, um, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't my fingers. <laughs> it was my house. It was my space. And this was not planned. And I see that is a huge difference between the kind of demonstrations we hear about and see now versus then. Yeah, definitely. That, that was, um, uh, Daniel Douglas Hume spelled H O M E home, but uh, it was pronounced Hume and he was well investigated. He was probably the, the foremost uh, medium of the 19th century, uh, and was investigated thoroughly by Sir William Crooks, one of my 11 witnesses. He, he conducted uh, 30 experiments with Hume, saw him levitated three times. And when I say, you know, people tend to say, well, uh, that a person levitated himself. The, the, the person didn't levitate. The person was supposedly levitated or lifted up by a spirit. That's what levitation is all about. Crook saw it 
you know, three times with uh, Hume, and he was asked, well, why not more than three? If you have 30 sittings with him, uh, why not more than three times? And he said, well, you know, sometimes Hume couldn't perform at all. There were days when he just couldn't, you know, achieve the uh, harmonious state that was required for him to produce something. He had good days and bad days, and and uh, that's the way it seems to be with all mediums, that they have their good days and their bad days. My guest, Michael Tim. And you can read this essay that we're talking about at BigelowInstitute.org. Back with more after a short break. Shopify helps businesses break sales records over the holidays with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. Consciousness, does it survive after death? My guest is Michael Tim, again, spelled T-Y-M-N, so you can do the Google search and find him. One of my favorite researchers is Hamlin Garland, who investigated mediums and wrote an interesting book, 30 Years of Psychical Research, I think it was called, or 40 Years, one of the two. Anyway, uh, he said he'd, he'd sit for hours sometimes in the dark waiting for something to happen. And in one case, he sat for four hours before anything happened. In another case, he um, found a medium in Los Angeles, very good and very evidential. He, he, he paid her way back to Boston to sit with a the group there. And then nothing happened with the group. She, just, she was just trying too hard. She couldn't, she couldn't you know, achieve the passive state um, it was necessary to produce, and then he sat with another group, and they, nothing happened. Finally, uh, he arranged a sitting at his home with uh, Professor Amos Dolbear, who was a famous uh, physicist at the time. They sat there for an hour, and nothing happened. And then uh, Dolbear said, "Let's let's give it up. Nothing, you know. It's not, you know. They, they were sitting in the dark, and just, you know, they didn't want to talk. They kept waiting for something. Nothing happened, and and." Garland said, well, let's just give it a few more minutes. And then about five minutes later, books started flying around the room. And it was light enough to see um, uh, these phantom hands stacking the books up. And then a um, spirit uh, who gave his name as Wilbur started talking and conversed with them for over an hour. That's been part of the problem is that um, the medium just has to be in the right state of mind, and maybe half the time they, they have a difficult time achieving that. And I, I think it also depends on the participants. Ingo Swan, I, who I have great respect for, one of the things he said was, if you have a skeptic in the room, it changes the dynamic. And I fully believe that. I've had it happen. <laughs> watched right, it. Right, right. So, okay, so, and I also like your analogy with the baseball that, you know, sometimes you can hit a home run, but you don't do it every time you're up to bat. Right, right. The lesson from baseball is that the the harder you try, the more difficult it is. I mean, you just got to make contact uh, and not, you know, if, if you're trying to hit a home run, it, it usually doesn't happen. It's just when you make contact that, that the ball fails out of the ballpark. Yeah, uh, what the the legend of Bagger Vance? When he's, you're in the zone, you see the zone, and all of a sudden everything fades away, and there it is. Right. Right. When you were researching this, and you said you started after you retired, what was the motivation? Right. Uh, I, re- I, I really don't know. I became interested. In, I, I grew up a Catholic. I was you know, raised in the Catholic Church, and about somewhere around age 30, I, I um, parted ways with the Catholic Church. And then when I turned 50, I, I, I've got to get back to some kind of religion. I just felt like I was getting old at the time. <laughs> needed something. So I, I, I went to a few... few um, you know, tried a few Protestant churches. I went to a Baptist church. I went to a Lutheran church. I went to a Episcopalian church, and they just didn't do it for me. And and uh, I, I guess the turning point. I, I was um, I was coach of uh, a Hawaii team um, uh, uh, that went to New York. We it was uh, called an Ekaden that they had teams from each state uh, uh, doing a relay around uh, Manhattan. Coincidentally, my wife happened to have a conference in Atlanta, Georgia, the same um, same weekend, uh, and uh, so I after the the race was over in New York, I jumped on a train and went down to uh, headed for Atlanta. I stopped in Washington D.C. for 
a day and was looking for a book and I came upon a book by Edgar Casey to read on the train and that, that sort of got me started. Um, and my, my initial interest was in reincarnation. Uh, and then I went to near death experiences and from near death experiences, I went to, um, uh, mediumship and I had a interesting, um, session in England on a trip to England in 1999. And that, that, after that, I, I focus more on mediumship than anything else. I can give you a little detail on my sitting with in England, if you yes, <laughs> absolutely care to hear that. Yeah, I uh, we were we, my wife and I were staying at a, um, a hotel in um, about a mile and about a half mile from Belgravia Square, which is where the um, uh, Spiritual Association of Great Britain was located. And so we were just out for a walk and came upon this uh, old Victorian house and, and they had a sign out in front with the, the name of their organization on it. It said readings every day from, or every day at three o'clock and six o'clock. So we were curious, went inside. It was about two thirty at the time. So we decided to wait for three, three o'clock, um, uh, reading. There were about, um, I don't know, 20 people there, and, and they had three rooms, the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle room, the Lord Dowding room, and the Sir Oliver Lodge room, I think it was, and we were in the, the Doyle room, I guess it was, and, the, but, you know, we were um, seated, and the lady comes in, a middle-aged woman, um, and she um, says, um, you know, I'm getting, uh, she, she points to somebody in the front row, I'm getting someone here who says, you were in France not too long ago. He was with you. And then she went on to relate some very evidential facts to the lady. I mean, the lady was just uh, nodding. Yes, yes, yes. I understand. That was my boyfriend. He died um, uh, just after the trip to France or whatever. I don't recall the details. But anyway, you know, it was very evidential to her. And she went to, you know, other people in the room. And then she finally, she comes to, uh, or she comes to my wife and says, I've got, Somebody, I got a, got a father figure here for you, and he's telling me that you um, you resemble him. Um, and then she she hesitated and said, "No, somebody says you resemble him." And my wife was very skeptical until that time, but but she she knew immediately what what uh, was being referenced. Her her uncle George, um, uh, her mother. My wife's mother said, you know, had told her a number of times, you resemble your Uncle George much more than you do your father. And so that was sort of a, a family joke. Uh, <laughs> and they they, they, they had talked about it the last time they met, which was like five years earlier. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that was very evidential to her. And then the, the medium said, and I've got an older lady here uh, who says that, um, you know, says not, don't forget your mother's birthday this year. And that was also evidential because my wife, we were on a trip for the, the prior year and we forgot her mother's birthday. So anyway, that was, that was supposedly her grandmother, but anyway, the, the, not, not, not the grandmother so much, but the, the uncle coming through that, I mean, how do you make up something like that? How do you read a person? I mean, she wasn't thinking about that. She had no idea that, uh, you know, something like that was going to come through and, and, um, that, that was very evidential to her, but then she came to me and said, I, I've got a George for you also. Um, she, she said, he's not coming through very clearly. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I knew I could think of two people named George, both were still alive as far as I knew. I just kept shaking my head. I don't know. I don't know. And she said, well, I'm not getting anything more from him. I'm sorry. And she went on to the next person. So, when we left, I, you know, I felt the only failure. Everybody else in the room seemed to get a, an evidential reading. Uh, anyway, we were driving around uh, England and Scotland and Wales uh, over the next 10 days, and we came back uh, to London, and my wife decided she wanted to go to um, uh, Harrods shopping. So I said, well, while you're at Harrods, I'm going to go back to, you know, the, the Spiritual Association. And it was, I think, 3 o'clock that day, and... So I went back by myself, and there was another clairvoyant there, an uh, elderly lady that uh, about 80 years old, came in with a walker, and she started out the same way, um, providing very evidential information to those in the, in the city. And she came to me, and she says, there's somebody named George standing behind you with his hands on your shoulder. And so I was, you know, 
quite, quite surprised, the same name, but I still couldn't think of who that George might be. And then she closed her eyes and thought, he's saying, he's saying that he's a uh, former colleague and that he died of a blood-related disease about 20 years ago. He said he's, he's been around you in your office and he, he's glad you have a job that you really like now. You know, it still didn't make sense to me. I mean, I was expecting my, my my deceased brother or a good friend who had died a year earlier to come through. I just wasn't, I couldn't think of anybody named George other than the two people who are still alive. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, as I was going back home on the underground with my wife, it all, all, all came to me. I mean, this George worked with me 20 years earlier. He was not a good friend. That's why I probably didn't think about him he was just somebody I went to coffee with a couple of times two or three times a week and uh, he knew I didn't like that job uh, we we talked about it um, quite a bit and I went to another I went to another company and heard about a year later after I left the company that George had died and I did but I didn't know what he died of and I when I got back home I called a friend who knew George I said what did George die of and he said leukemia yeah. blood related disease mm. And he died in 1979, which is 20 years before um, my reading it in, in London. So it all began to make sense then. And George knew that from my many discussions, I didn't like that job. And so his comment about, I'm glad you have a job now that you like, which I did. I liked the job I was in at the time in 1999 very much. So it all made sense. And, you know, there were a couple other points. I can't think of what they were right now, but there were seven points that all, you know, made it clear and you know I related that story to um you know a number of people after I got back home and all that they probably uh, did a re- you know, did some research on you beforehand or you know this this is before there was much on the internet uh, you wouldn't have found that story on the internet anyway even if you could uh, could find it it's now chapter 1 in my my last book no one really dies but um uh as I t- told the people, I mean, number one, they didn't have, nobody, I didn't give my name to anybody at the time, and, and uh, we just paid our six British pounds, I guess it was, and, and uh, $10 US, and sat there. Nobody asked for our name, so how could they do any research? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 What I like about that, I interviewed a guy, uh, a a doctor who became a medium and he's in that area. And the thing was that that's the way they practice. They draw names or at one point decide who's going to go do the event. And if somebody like if the little lady hadn't shown up and called in sick or something, then someone else would be on the line and and go in and do readings. And it's a way to practice and to become more adept and more fluent in being able to pick up those signs from other people. I think it's brilliant that you were able to experience that. And not only that, it was so spot on. Yeah, yeah. And that's the only good reading I've had. I mean, I I really don't have a need to sit with mediums. Uh, I don't grieve that much. I went to about maybe five or six mediums, and most of them are very general, not specific as this one was. My interest has been in the old research, trying to translate. I, you know, I majored in journalism in college, and when I read the various researchers from yesteryear, it was very long-winded. You know, one paragraph would take three pages, two <laughs> or three pages. And, yeah. And, yeah, so my objective in writing this, uh, in in studying this, was to try and take this old um, research and convert it to layman's language uh, in, you know, many yeah. paragraphs instead of one big paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and it, it is difficult because, yeah, some of it, it's, it's so obtuse. Is that a word? Um, th- th- you just get tired before you even read it because it looks like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to plow through this. And there are some fantastic nuggets. And so that's what you've tried to bring out and to highlight the gems, like the levitation issue. And then the other thing about where they got tired because we were so thick-headed and uh, stubborn <laughs> we wanted all the all, all the the you know the in your face kind of stuff rather than saying hey guys improve yourself become more telepathic expand your awareness and you'll go far and instead it's like can you levitate the couch <sighs> that's that's challenging yeah yeah have you experienced any kind of paranormal things as a result of your interest in this 
Uh, small ones that, um, you know, with the electricity going off at a certain time. Uh, the one I experience most often, almost regularly, is I'll be reading a book while the TV's on in the next room or something, and I'll read a, come to a word in the book, and I hear the exact word on the TV, and I, I can't find any meaning to those. Um, but that happens, uh, like, two or three times a month, I guess. Um, I don't know, but the, the one experience I did have, sort of an out-of-body experience, was back in uh, 1979, I think it was. I was a competitive runner. Um, it, was, it was a four-mile race here in Hawaii, uh, um, two times around a two-mile course, and I was leading, I was sharing the lead with another runner, a young college student, and um, it's also we we came at the two-mile point, and the, the the uh, official read out the time is nine nine minutes thirty two seconds. I said, "Wow, wow!" wow. Just, you know, I I was surprised at the time. I didn't expect to be going that fast, and it, it felt so effortless. I just uh, it felt like I was cruising, uh, and all of a sudden I was above my body, looking at at myself and the other runner, and and that lasted only for about three seconds. And when I was back in my body. I began to feel the effort. I began to struggle, and I mean, I ended up uh, finishing the race and finishing second. But that that moment, that those three seconds, it was just that looking down at myself. I can still picture it. Uh, uh, and you know, they they say that runners and other athletes have get a high. I I, I had another number of other experiences where I was running and it felt effortless. But that was the one, the only one that I ever felt. <laughs> Yeah, like I was out of my body. Yeah, you definitely were. Yeah, yeah, and uh, high is a whole different level. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. What was it like to win the contest? I mean, I, you were a runner-up, and and but what was that like? Uh, well, I I, I um, was hoping to be one of the top three, but I realized since I don't have a PhD or an MD, that I I probably wasn't going to be among the top three. Uh, so I was satisfied with just the runner up position. Um, uh, and you know, as far as the money concerned, I wasn't doing it for the money. I was just hoping that, you know, 20% of it went for taxes anyway, and the rest <laughs> went for, for, for a new fence. So that was not a big deal. Uh, um, but you know, I, I'm happy with it. And I understand the winning, um, papers are going to be, uh, published in a book soon. I, I actually expected the book to be out by this time. I don't know what, at what stage they're at now, but the, the book will be released um, sometime this year, I think. I'm hoping that it will draw more attention to your work because I'm so glad. H- having gone through and tried to figure out some of these, the mediums that are no longer being talked about. I think Emma Twig is one, and then there's um, another one that uh, Alex Tanis, there, there sees that have been studied and researched, and yet there's hardly a word anywhere about what they've done and their, their um, achievements and to have your information, especially with some of your other books. And I did, I, I really, 2020 was an interest, interesting year. And this is when I got the afterlife revealed. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and, you know, it's it just that kind of information is, is worth its weight in gold. The one medium that, that I hold above all other mediums, as far as offering evidential information, I mean, Leonora Piper, I wrote a book about, I mean, she's number two, I guess, but Edda Wright, W R I E D T Henrietta Wright was her actual name to me is is number one and her story is is offered a number of books but the one book that uh, does it best is by Vice Admiral uh, Yusban Moore it's it's been republished by White Crow Books which has published my books and anyway Edda Wright thirteen different languages came through her she she was from Detroit Michigan. And her language, according to Moore, was Yankee. I mean, she um, she spoke only English, but 13 different languages came through her, including um, uh, Bosnian, um, Serbian, German, French, Arabian, um, yeah, and a number of other languages. And it's just difficult to believe that there's any other explanation for that. I mean, in addition to the languages coming through, there's very evidential information. There was one that a... Um, uh, ambassador from Croatia was sitting with uh, her and uh, a former friend who had died um, 
six months or so earlier, began communicating in Croatian and providing information that, you know, nobody else knew and, you know, he was aware of, and but there was new information that, that he wasn't aware of. So, I mean, it's just difficult to believe that that's telepathy or, or some secondary personality in Edda Wright's uh, subconscious was um, manufacturing all of that information and, and speaking in a language that she didn't know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's... It's fascinating. I think you make a case that we have too many distractions now. You know, back then we didn't have the internet. We didn't have TV. We didn't have all the other things that are right now great pacifiers, but they don't give us any, any way to advance our own spiritual abilities. Right. Right. And apparently most mediums take some time to develop. Sophia um, uh, Williams is uh, another favorite medium. Uh, she was Hamlin Garland, who I mentioned earlier, studied her quite extensively and she she wrote a book that took her four years before anything you know she she had any kind of uh, mediumistic ability she had to sit every day for an hour or even two hours and just concentrate and focus meditate or whatever how many people really have that kind of you know patience or persistence to sit for an hour every day for four years uh, i i once tried the ouija board uh, just to see uh, if anything would happen, I, I gave up after 20 minutes. I've never tried again. I just don't have, <laughs> <laughs> don't have the patience or persistence. Uh, okay, I'll tell you to, what. Yeah. I've had this experience of doing things, and my experience has been not, now going for 25 years. The first time I actually noticed an EVP, and it's it's specific. It was 17 minutes in to me doing a solo podcast, and I didn't edit it out. There was a blurb on the tape, on the audio, and I thought, okay, I'm, that's usually what I edit out. Well, I had enhanced the audio. I went back, and I realized it's a word, and the word is specific. It relates to me, and it's an EVP. But that's 25 years of somehow looking the other direction and having other experiences that I count on and not looking at that particular element as a, as a possibility. So, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a persistence, endurance, and patience. Right. I also noted that you, um, 20 years of research with Emily French. My friend Riley, um, oh boy, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm bad on name. you know, if somebody tries to communicate me out, communicate with me after I die and they ask for names, I'm not going to be able to come up with any of them because <laughs> I can't come up with them now. <laughs> no, uh, Riley Haggerty. Okay. Riley Haggerty has written several books on, uh, Emily French. Um, but the, the, it's very, um, philosophical stuff. There's very little in the way of evidential material that came through Emily French. And that's um, one of the big differences with her. Uh, you know, there's, I think there's only one evidential point that came through that I'm aware of with her, but uh, it's all philosophical. I don't know. I think that's the point. That the, the mind is where we have to start and getting into consciousness is the next step. And you have to open your mind to be able to step into the consciousness element. There's a, the, the finding meaning. This is chapter nine in your book, The Afterlife Revealed, and this is Silver Birch. Mm-hmm. Your world mm-hmm. must realize that revelation is continuous and progressive, fitting itself to the stage of understanding to the people to whom it comes. In other words, it's personal. Right. Once we are able to accept that, that we're not all going to have a cookie cutter, one size fits all experience of reality, I think we will expand leaps and bounds beyond what we are, where we are now. But I also think what you have done to go back and connect the dots is essential because we have to learn from the past, from those who've, who've basically laid out a template and given us uh, a few breadcrumbs to make the path work. I agree. What would you like to add? Uh, nothing that it, other than the fact that, you know, it takes a lot of focus and a lot of concentration to, to really grasp what these old researchers did. It took 15 years before I really understood what was going on. I started reading it actually in the early 1990s, but after that 1999 session in London, I, I focused more on it. And I think I had to read the, the research on Leonora Piper three times before it really began to make sense. Most people are not going to read it more than once. Uh, if they get through it the first time, there. M- most friends I've I've recommended it to they they begin to read it and say, "No, I, I, that's that's not for me." And that that's the problem. That's what I've tried to do with my books is just to put it in layman's language um, so that it's understandable. But if you do go to the original, original sources, the the um, 
reports and books by the early researchers, they're not going to stay with it. You know, um, that, that, that's the big problem. Well, I like your vlog. I followed that. That's where I found you at White Crow Books, and that's where I found your books. And so I'm really glad that you're doing that because I find a lot of use in, you know, just seeing what you're thinking about how you're approaching the topic. And the fact that you live in Hawaii, well, okay, you've got icing on the cake there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been here for um, 50 years now, and I'm ready to move back to the mainland, but I'm too old to move back. So <laughs> I, I guess I, I guess I'm stuck. Uh, here, I mean, as I've told a number of people, uh, the first year I was here, I went swimming every day. The second year, I went swimming every week. The third year, I went swimming every uh, month. Now, the only time I go is once a year when we get we, we have a visitor, a granddaughter, somebody who comes. We take take to the beach, but it's a great play. I mean, as far as the weather concern is concerned, we have uh, you know 80 degrees year around. I think it's 84, 85 today. A bit humid, but uh, you get rock fever here. You need to travel, and I used to travel about three times uh, a year, but in the last, since COVID and even before COVID, um, not so much. So yeah, you were a world traveler. And, Looking at all the places you had been, you had traveled all over. Yeah, you know, I have a bad case of rock fever now, and so does my wife. We want to go someplace, but we don't know where to go, and because of COVID and the expenses now and so forth, uh, we're, we're stuck here. Everything's changed. Okay, well, if you had to be stuck somewhere, all right, just, yeah. you know, <laughs> saying from the mainland center of the United States, where there's lots of rocks and trees. Right. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, I'll send you a picture of rocks, okay? Will that help? Maybe some Arkansas okay, rocks. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's the home of Bigfoot, just to get you out of your doldrums. Right, okay. Well, I appreciate your time, and, and I really, I, I do, I think that, even though it wasn't one of the top three, it was so essential. I'm so glad it's included because this is where this is where the gold is, the, the, the gems, the initial interest in mediumship and spiritualism and spirituality comes from these people who who were doing boots on the ground work before anybody knew it was possible. Right. Again, appreciate the opportunity to um, talk about this and and hope that. You know, some people will take a look at my blog, which goes back about 13 years. I've got uh, like 300 different uh, blogs set up there um, on different subjects. And again, that's whitecrowbooks.com. And the name, right. Michael Tim, T-Y-M-N. So you can do the Google search and not get lost. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll put links in the description for the show. Thank you for listening. And if you are curious, or if you know a friend who's curious, check it out. The Afterlife Revealed is the book I'm going to recommend, What Happens After We Die. That's the book. And then the other, the blog. And then hopefully we'll see the results of the Bigelow contest in a book form so people can read your information there. Or you can go to the Bigelow website and all of those winning essays are published there. Thank you for listening.